Yeah, here one has to distinguish between the technological and the theoretical point of view. Mm -hmm. So technologically speaking, brain imaging began 15, 50 years ago mm -hmm. when people um, infused radioactive substances into the brain tissue of animals. Mm -hmm. and then afterwards they would put this between x-ray plates and then you could actually see where um, the cortical processing has happened. And since then, since the 70s, uh, we have new methods like positron emission tomography. And it's particularly since the 90s, which is now very widespread, uh, is the functional magnetic resonance imaging. And the advantage of these methods are um, that they can investigate the whole brain in living human beings, in the case of fMRI, even without any side effects. But the idea uh, behind this approach goes actually way back into the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, when people um, thought about localizing brain functions. So the idea that by investigating the brain, and the people did this, had to do this from the outside in the very beginning, this was called phrenology, that you could see something about the mental capacities of the person. And now we are in a position where we can investigate the processes also within the brain. So the idea has a much longer tradition, but the technology basically is like 20, 30 years old. Yeah, here I'm thinking basically about fMRI, so the functional magnetic resonance imaging I uh, talked about before. And this is a method that uses blood flow, differences in blood flow, blood flow in order to find out something about differences in neural processing. And one limitation one has to be aware of is that the temporal resolution of this method is really very bad. So while we know that electrical signals uh, in the brain are really um, transferred on a millisecond level, the, what we can measure on the fMRI is on a much call, more coarse grained level, namely in the, the, the level of seconds. So it's actually more than a thousand times slower than what is really going on on the neural level. And then uh, the other point is more from the physiological and biological point of view that the um, connection between the changes in the neural processing and the blood flow in the brain still are not really uh, well understood. And what strikes me um, as surprising somehow is how now cognitive brain researcher, researchers talk about yeah, the way neurals, neural networks are working by investigating the blood flow because there are so many open questions uh, where there is research going on and which have to be answered to really understand what the brain is doing. Yeah, I mean, we are getting there in that sense that there are ever more experiments which try to distinguish between truth and lies. But if you look closer at the design of these experiments, what you will recognize is that they are not really close to what a real lie is. So for example, in most of these experiments, people wouldn't be in a situation like we are now in talking to each other and I would perhaps try to convince you of something which is not true. But people are just pressing buttons, for example, and looking at the computer screen. And we know from social neuroscience, for example, that it makes a real difference whether you are interacting with a person directly or whether you're doing something with the computer machine. And there are many more limitations of, of these tasks. And what strikes me as surprising is uh, the claims that some companies make on their websites, for example. So there is this American company called No Limeri, and they claim literally on their homepage, and they have been doing this for years, that they have developed the first true lie detection machine that has ever been there on Earth. But if you look at the science that's behind this, you will see that it's really very preliminary. And they try to market this now to employees, uh, employers, to the government, to every private person who would be interested in having such a lie detection machine. But I think they're really far from getting them to have a true lie detector. Yeah, so for a couple of years now, neuroscientists are really saying that they can do mind reading. At least some of them are saying this, literally. Others will call it a little bit different, like brain interpretation or brain reading or decoding from the brain. And they are really remarkable experiments. I, I do, not, do not deny this. Um, but the way these experiments are presented in the media is, is really problematic. Because many of the limitations in the experimental design are really not I read and explain to the public. For example, there has been one study where uh, the researchers claim that they can 
predict from uh, unconscious information processing in the brain up to 10 seconds before what kind of, of a decision a subject will make. And this is uh, really remar a really remarkable and bold claim. But if you look at the experiments, you will see, for example, this prediction does not really work on a very high level. So where 100% would be um, the best outcome and 50% would be random, they're around 60%. So that's not really such a big prediction. And then even more um, important is that they actually had to exclude two-thirds of their experimental subjects in order to get this result. So as it turned out, such a simple decision the subjects had to make in the experiment happened to be well, so difficult for the subjects that really more than 60% of the people had to be excluded. And you can see from this that these experiments are not really very valid because in everyday life everybody of us is making decisions all of the time. So there's really a big difference between what you're investigating in the experiments in the laboratory and what you are um, investigating or what you're doing in the real world. And I think this is fine and science works this way, but researchers and journalists should not forget this when they are talking about their results in the media.